Deion Sanders has brought tons of attention to Colorado football, and we're going to tell you how he did that and how he's been doing everything he's been doing this offseason. You are Locked On Buffs, your daily podcast on the Colorado Buffaloes, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, everybody? I'm Kevin Borba, and joining me is the lovely, the recruiting insider, John Garcia Jr. John, how are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm, I'm honored to be on the inaugural Locked On Buffs podcast episode. It should be a lot of fun, and, and heck, we all know the timing is pretty much ideal to talk about Dion and the crew. There's a reason that we're we're having this podcast, John. Dion's popping, Colorado's popping, and we're going to talk to you about how he's bringing the success. We're going to talk to you about Eric Bieniemy, former Colorado coach, his success at the NFL, and then we're going to talk a little realignment. But before we do that, we need to give a shout out to one of our sponsors, LinkedIn. With LinkedIn Jobs, you can hire qualified candidates more officially by matching open roles with people who have the skills, values, and experiences to help you achieve your 2023 goals. Post your jobs for free at linkedin.com slash locked on colleges. Terms and conditions apply. Okay, John, I previewed it a little bit. Let's dive into it. We need four ways that Deion Sanders has built Buzz and Boulder. You start, and then we'll just ping pong this thing back and forth. Well, you introduced me as a recruiting guy, so I've got to go That's true. That's to the true. tangible, right? Obviously, this class of 2023 that Dion was able to bring in, splashes i mean really big hit after big hit you start to peruse the colorado commitment list just from the high school perspective and you see former miami commitment cormani mclean former notre dame commitment dylan edwards former auburn commitment adam hopkins former nebraska commitment or murray Miller. you get the point right a lot of flips a lot of changes of heart from the moment dion took over in boulder it wasn't just hey um, catchy taglines and, and the whole Louis Vuitton joke about overhauling the roster. He started to do it immediately by every means necessary, not just any, but every portal, certainly bringing his own guys and obviously recruiting the high school ranks. And, and you had splashes along the way. Obviously, Cormani McClain got most of the headlines and rightfully so. Highest ranked recruit, number one corner in the country, all of those things. But really, to me, the impressive haul was everybody else hitting the ground running and getting some of these kids committed like an Adam Hopkins before they ever visited Boulder, not only committed, but signed. So you talk about belief and you talk about buzz. There's not much more tangible than a coach carrying so much cachet that recruits signed with him sight unseen. It's just not something we see in the recruiting industry. So the tangible with Dion came very quickly after he took the job uh, there at Colorado. And obviously every other element of recruiting has created its own buzz in and of itself. Big recruiting class, second biggest transfer portal class in the country, including you know Travis Hunter, Shador Sanders, the guys that are the headliners back then and still today as we look forward. And then simultaneously recruiting 2024 and 2025, they've got commitments across the board uh, in all of those classes in just a couple of months. So really fascinating to see, yes, all the buzz, but the tangible victories thereafter. It's not just fodder, it's fact. Yeah, he's bringing over over 40 new people to the roster. He really he really overhauled that thing like he said he would. Um, I think the thing that stands out for me, and I have a little flashback moment for all of us, when USC was running college football in the early 2000s and Pete Carroll was on the sidelines with Reggie Bush and all them, there was also a lot of famous people on the sidelines with them. There was Snoop Dogg, Will Ferrell, and whoever it may be. USC was the hub. Colorado and Boulder is turning into the hub of college football right now. I think more people have cared and been interested about Colorado football than they have in my lifetime and possibly yours as well. Um, they got Lil Wayne touring the campus. They have Adam Pacman Jones saying Deion Sanders is going to be the GOAT coach just because of what he does. And I think there's a notion around Colorado, which if you haven't been there, um, you think of the snow, you think of the cold. And I think there's a notion that Deion's trying to break that Colorado one isn't that cold. He said it multiple times. It's not that cold. He's been telling everybody who will listen that he loves Colorado 
And he too, he's bringing famous people onto campus. Like having Lil Wayne on campus is a much bigger deal to, than people realize because recruits, like you talked about, they see that. They see, oh, Lil Wayne might be on the sideline when I'm playing football. Oh, Adam Pacman Jones might be on the sideline when I'm playing football. I think it brings a whole new level of excitement um, when the most notable people in the world, um, in some cases like Lil Wayne, are on campus in Boulder because that's not something that was happening under Carl Durrell or whoever came before them. Yeah, and that's before games even begin, right? I mean, that's even more impressive. These are random, you know, holiday, early New Year visits that really don't, you know, make a lot of sense and don't happen a lot elsewhere. So it's one thing to do it at games, and now we're doing it just for practices, workouts, and just so people can actually see the facility. And that's not even getting into all the other people that want to get over there to see what Prime's got going on. And and then speaking of the tangible, we talked about recruiting players how about Dion's recruitment of coaches mm -hmm. i mean you pulled multiple head coaches over to colorado including sean lewis the offensive coordinator and then by the way with lewis you held off other schools who were then interested in sean over the last several weeks and months but i love some of these other assistant coach hires charles kelly has been everywhere in that sec acc footprint you know that's exactly where where Dion came up and that's where he wants to recruit from i would say primarily of course uh when you go outside of that pac-12 footprint i love that ad pulling him from alabama tim brewster of course has been everywhere as well was also with dion there at, at jackson state i thought that was a good one and then some of the off the field hires the first time i remember kind of perusing the names i was like i remember him playing i remember him playing i remember what he was doing five years ago so he's bringing back names who have been in and around the sport and even played it at the highest level, like Kevin Mathis, the, the cornerbacks coach, who was a teammate of his with the Dallas Cowboys, uh, or bringing up great high school coaches like Rod Chaney from Lehigh Acres, a, a high school and FSU teammate of Dion's who's been in high school football this whole time. Now he's going to run some of the off the field uh, recruiting staffing roles. So uh, a lot of mix and match. They retained a couple of good coaches as well. But I just think the ceiling and the ability to go out and get guys who had Pretty good jobs. I mean, Sean Lewis was the head coach uh, over at Kent State. Uh, so to pull them as assistants again before you've coached your first game at the FBS or Power 5 level, very impressive. And, and again, it just creates more benefit of the doubt um, and tangible ability uh, for, for expectations, I think, right out of the gate with Colorado. It's tough. The Pac-12 is great. We'll talk about it plenty, I'm sure, going forward. But the staff he assembled is just as impressive as some of the big name recruits that he pulled uh, in short notice. Yeah, exactly. And the staff is when you think about who they're fending off to, it's not like they're fending off like a Kent State or whatever. Sean Lewis was tabbed as the guy for the Notre Dame job. Um, he's yeah. He's from that area. Um, he knows the Chicago area well and can recruit. So that's like a perfect hire for Notre Dame. That hire makes all the sense in the world for Sean Lewis and Marcus Freeman over at Notre Dame. But Deion Sanders was able to convince him that, hey, Colorado has a vision. You're a part of it. Um, I think everybody's going to be excited to see that fast bus offense or whatever whatever he calls it. He has a, a saying for his offense. It's very fast. That's all you need to know. And Charles Kelly, recruiter of the year. I don't think it gets any better than that. Plucked him right out of Alabama. Was able to kind of take someone from Nick Saban's area of college football and help him recruit the South because – as we all know, John, and he's going to your neck of the woods. He wants the kids from the South. He wants the, the Floridians, the Texans. He wants all those guys. Um, I think this kind of ties into recruiting, and this will be our last point on this, recruiting, transfers, whatever it may be. There was an NFL award show about a week or so ago. Um, they're, they're talking about who the MVP is, most improved, coach of the year. Um, Patrick Mahomes is MVP. We knew it was going to happen. Um, there, all this debate about um, NFL, and Deion Sanders is there, first of all, not only is he on every show imaginable um, going up to that award show, I think there was 150 total radio spots available. And I think he probably hit everyone at least once, if not twice. Um, everybody wanted Dion. And then he was also presenting an award. Um, and when he goes up there, he Dion has a swagger. Coach Prime has a swagger charisma to him that kind of, I don't think people realize how, outgoing and electric of a personality he has i think people see him as cocky sometimes but he seems really nice he seems genuine and so he told 
And he kind of talked about this before he went. He said, I'm a businessman. I got to make money. And that's why he was there. And so I was like, okay, so we understand why he's not on campus during winter workouts because this was during winter workouts at the time. Well, as he's presenting the award, he goes, I'll be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity. And then gives a shout out to Colorado football. And he's like, if you are nephews, your cousins, whatever, telling all the NFL athletes in the room, all the famous people in the room, send your, your recruits my way to Colorado. And I think one, not no other coach in, col- or in college football is getting the opportunity to present that award, if we're being honest. Um, I think, and w- when you interviewed Kylan Fox, the four-star from this upcoming class, he talked about a little bit, Dion's the coolest coach in college football right now. And we're seeing that because no other college coach is getting those opportunities to be in the public perception that much or putting himself in the public perception that much. And so I think just having that constantly in people's minds is bringing a lot of attention to Colorado, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. It's it's ambitious too, right? I mean, it's it's tough to be 100% honest and kind of uh, forward with almost everything you do. And and that's what Dion is doing here, right? We see the Amazon Prime documentaries, social media, and his access is just tapped. Uh, he's almost available 24-7, it seems like. And then, as you said, Kevin, in the margins now, Super Bowl week, boom, I'm there to recruit, you know, collecting a check, sure. But recruiting and 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 he's been so honest within all of those opportunities um, and it's it's going to create a bit of a line right a push pull hey this is too much he's saying too much that's all good that is all good for Dion and it's all good for Colorado and and Dion has said some some bold things here just in the the last few weeks that's not going to slow down in my opinion but it, it takes a lot to do that because. Nick Saban don't do that. Kirby Smart don't do that. Jimbo Fisher, they they do it in very small spats. And then they like end up apologizing and clarifying thereafter. I don't think we're going to see that from Dion. I think he's going to be like, hey, this is what I said. And that's what I said. Um, Doesn't mean everyone's going to agree with everything. But again, it will build and maintain so much buzz for him and for Colorado, which is in in this day and age, one in the same, right? It's recruiting, it's NIL, it's branding. And who's a better individual brand than Deion Sanders in, in this sport that, that we all love so much. So it's already been fascinating and I have, you know, the feeling it's not going to slow down anytime soon. Right. And when your coach has an alias coach prime, I mean, we got an alias like that, you know, you're big time. And I think also, I think he's unapologetically himself and I don't think we'll ever get an apology from Deion Sanders unless like things go horribly wrong. And 10 years in the future, he looks back and thinks of, oh, maybe I shouldn't have said that. But in the moment, Deion Sanders is going to be him. He's let everybody know he's going to be him. And I think that's why Colorado is becoming as hot as he is, as hot as it is. And it brings the attention, brings the buzz. Um, There's a reason that we have a Locked on Buffs podcast now. There's a reason that me and John are over at Athlon covering Colorado. Deion Sanders is there. There's a new excitement for a program that has won, has been finished above 500 once in the past six years. And that was the COVID year. There's a reason there is some buzz around it. And you just got to look at the sideline and the little ball cap and you'll find Deion Sanders there. And that's why. Um, before we move on to our next topic, which will be Eric B. Enemy's coaching move, we have to do this ad from LinkedIn. As a small business owner or hiring manager, you know that success in 2023 all depends on the team members you surround yourself with. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. With LinkedIn Jobs, you can hire qualified candidates more efficiently by matching open roles with people who have the skills, values, and experiences to help you achieve your goals. I know me personally, I've found all the jobs I've gone through LinkedIn. Um, You can connect with people. You could message people. You could put on your work. You could show other people um, what they're missing if they don't know you per se. Um, LinkedIn Jobs help you quickly attract qualified candidates to your open jobs with targeting tools. They go beyond the resume data by using insights from your job post companies and uh, their 875 million member profiles to put you in front of the most qualified candidates. Identify the most qualified candidates on LinkedIn jobs and connect with them fast and for free. LinkedIn jobs makes it easy to screen and rate applicants based on your job qualifications on one platform. Again, 2023, we all want to achieve goals. We all want to bring the right people onto our job force. LinkedIn Jobs is the place to do it. It's why small small business rates LinkedIn Jobs the number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Okay. 
Thank you for listening. This is Locked on Buffs podcast, by the way. Um, We're here every day, wherever you get your podcast. Thank you for making this your first listen of the day. But we have a second listen for you. Make sure to check out your brand, our brand new podcast, Locked on College Basketball. Everything you need to know about college basketball in one place. Plus, you hear from experts, big name experts, insiders, coaches, and players. Locked on College Basketball, available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcast. Okay, it's time to dive into Eric Bieniemy, the former Colorado coach. Um, he's on the move in the NFL rings, um, not in the position that people thought I would be. He took the Washington Commanders offensive coordinator slash assistant head coaching position. John, what are your thoughts on the move? You know, I'm kind of in the camp of everyone else. I know there's always more to the story and there's always lay, really layers and layers. I mean, Eric Bieniemy has been in the football spotlight since the 80s. So there's a lot in that time span, uh, 30 plus years. But over the last few years, which really, if we're being honest, hot NFL coaches, that's really all it takes, right? If you're the hot up and comer, boom, you're fast tracked to, to a head coaching job. After that first Chiefs Super Bowl, you know, the whole breakout for Mahomes, switching over from Alex Smith under Andy Reid in this system, from then you were kind of like, okay, casually. Eric Bieniemy is not going to be there very long, right? Because this is the hot offense, the hot system, and he's got some credit to take for the breakout player and new face of the league, Patrick Mahomes, right? Um, Especially now with Brady gone. Um, But it just kind of didn't happen. And it was very public. There were a lot of frustrations. And I think what's unique about this one, Kevin, is folks knew he wanted to be a head coach. I think Sometimes there's a lot a loss in translation a little bit. Hey, I'm good being an OC. It's like in college, like Brent Venables was at Clemson forever under Dabo Sweeney. And it was just like, okay, at some point he just like be, likes being the coordinator until Oklahoma came open and, and he made his move. Finally, not the case with Eric. I mean, this was kind of well known that he wanted to be a head coach. So every year that went on and the Chiefs offense were, was great every year uh, that he was there every year that went on, you were just kind of more and more surprised. And then here we are at the end of of 22 into 23 chiefs on another run, they win the super bowl. And there's still a couple of jobs that were open. I think Indianapolis and Arizona were still open. You're like, all right, well, here you go. Another tailor made handoff for Eric B enemy to land one of these jobs. And it goes to the two coordinators from Philly that he just beat in the super bowl. So which are younger and less experienced, less notable, all of those things. So it does make you scratch your head. You know, it makes you start to ask a whole lot of questions. You know, how much did the adolescent issue slow down Eric B um, You know, how much is, is being held with, with some of those eighties, nineties, early two thousand situations. And then at what point do you move on from those things? Right. It just makes you ask more questions than you have the answers to. So I do see, yeah, he's the associate head coach in Washington now, but he had that title in Minnesota in 2010, 13 years ago. So this feels lateral. I know he wants to get out of that Andy Reid shadow, which is understandable, but a lot of other coaches have gotten out of that shadow and had multiple head coaching opportunities, like a Doug Peterson, while the enemy took this long just to get out of the shadow in any way, shape, or form. So obviously long overdue. Again, we don't know everything, um, but man, the hottest OC for the hottest team and the hottest quarterback after two Super Bowls in four years and a couple other AFC title games in between, really hard to build the argument against bringing in an Eric B enemy. So happy for him if this is his next step or the next step towards a head coaching job. Obviously a Colorado great um, you know, national champion, all American running back, all of those things, and has been in the game ever since as a coach. So uh, a lot of people wanted the enemy to be the head coach when Dion was hired. I think it kind of worked out better from a recruiting and talent acquisition standpoint, but certainly uh, we're still tracking the enemy here on this podcast. And, and it's for a reason, right? He's, he's a Colorado legend. And at, at some point, maybe he'll be an NFL legend and all of this will be something to look back and laugh on. But yeah, I I was kind of like everyone else. I was very surprised, not only that it took this long for him to move on, but that it's still not for a a true head coaching gig. I mean, Andy Reid had to like beg and plead for him to have that opportunity that he had to say after another ring, hey, I want Eric to be able to go run the show. I mean, it shouldn't have taken 
this long. And I think the chip on his shoulder, uh, Eric's that is, is, is only growing. And Washington's a heck of a project for him. If he could turn that one around, though, I think he's going to make a lot of people eat crow and he'll fast track himself once again, in theory, to another head coaching spot. Yeah, I think the thing that the sti- this part that makes it a sticky situation is he's proven that obviously he has success at the NFL level. He's produced MVPs, all pros, Travis Kelsey, Tyreek Hill, Patrick Mahomes. They're all thriving under his um, tutelage. Like it's there's no secret. Um, I think the biggest and this isn't me talking. This is just kind of what the the reports and the speculations is that Andy Reid has a heavy hand in calling plays, um, which is allegedly what has been limiting um the enemy now obviously we know coaches like jeff saturday had never had any fall experience and was just hopped right in to the to the indianapolis colts gig and then um i don't think one of the i think it was the eagle one of the eagles coordinators didn't call plays either and so i don't know if that's the reason i i'm gonna say that's probably not the reason i think there's um just some underlying things that's been going on in, in the nfl at the nfl level a lot there's a reason for the rooney rule um i would probably go down that path if we're being honest um, I just think that this job, while it does seem like a lateral move, I think it's a approve yourself move in a way. Um, you have Sam Howell at quarterback. You have Antonio Gibson. Um, your best wide receiver is Terry McLaurin, which, I mean, Terry is very good, but he's no Travis Kelsey. He's no Tyree Kill. Um, he's he's up there. He's a very good receiver in the NFL. It's just you're putting yourself in a situation with, um, for lack of a better term, less talented players and skill players to kind of show that I can help these guys win games. And I think – the reason that the commander's job, which is so weird to call them the commanders, I don't know what I would want to call that long. name. Too long. Too, a yeah. Whole other, it's a whole other podcast, but my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> it's Go a on. weird, weird name. Um, but I think the, the good thing about that job is Ron Rivera is a defensive minded coach. Ron Rivera's focus is on the defense. He works on the defense side of the ball. And so essentially, it's like the enemy will be the head coach of the offense. Um, he's going to have nobody who's looking over his shoulder going, I think we should call this here, or I see what you're doing, but. Um, it's going to be free reign, which also means he's going to get all the blame when the time comes um, because Washington is a struggling franchise. They always have been. They always I won't say they always will be because I want to have faith in our guy, Eric Bieniemy. But Washington's franchise has success or historically not been the most successful. Um, but this is a good hire for Washington because, one, they get a guy who can develop Sam Howell, who showed flashes last year um, in limited preseason time and towards the end of the year. And it just gives him the opportunity to kind of show that he's much more than what we all thought. Um, Do you think that Washington is kind of banking on the fact that he's going to develop their team and leave after one year? Or are you hoping, or do you think this is a long-term investment for them? It's probably a multi-year deal. Uh, Just from the outside looking in, the NFC East is, it ebbs and flows, but it's really good right now. Uh, Three playoff teams, obviously this year, I don't think anybody was under 500. Uh, obviously Philly in that division as well. So that's an uphill battle. Uh, that That's a program or an organization in Washington that has been pretty dysfunctional, uh, a lot of turnover. There's still a lot of questions about ownership and stuff like that. So I, I feel like it's a multi-year deal um, if the trajectory stays up. But that's the thing about the NFL. It, it flips so very often. So if, if something can happen sooner rather than later, I couldn't imagine – more uh, equity in a move for, for B enemy, because if you turn that thing around in that division that I think everyone could recognize is, if not the best, right, right up there with the best divisions, you just had a Super Bowl representative there uh, and multiple playoff teams. If you could turn it around there, I think he raises any doubt that still exists on his play calling, uh, on his ability to game plan and, and scheme guys open, because like you said, Every time they go out there on Sundays or or Mondays or Thursdays or whatever it is, they're not going to be the most talented offense almost every single week. So uh, that's an uphill battle. But if if they can produce points and manufacture it with that roster, then he should get all of that credit. Uh, So I I do think it's probably a multiple year thing. But if it turns around in a big way next year, yeah, I think fast track. And this time next year, we're talking about Eric leading his own franchise as the head coach, finally, which – I uh, can't wait for that press conference personally. Exciting things to come for Eric Bandemi. I know he's going to find some sort of success there. It'd, it'd be shocking if he didn't, to be quite frank. Um, before we move on to our last topic of the day, we have to give a shout out to one of the best, if not the best, in my opinion, delicious treats out there. It's a building or a built bar t- um 
protein bar. They're the best. Um, me and John talked about before the before the show. I'm out here doing yoga. I was getting a workout in before the show. I know John's out there pumping the iron a little bit. Um, this is a good snack for you if you're just needing a quick healthy snack. Um, it's a delicious treat with all without all the fat and calories that you got to try. Uh, Built Bar. Um, we just got through the holidays, and I know my goal is to le- eat a little healthier, um, a little less Mexican food for me, a little more moderation. If you're like me when you want to eat healthier but don't know what to compromise and you don't want to compromise taste, then I've got the thing just for you. You got to try Built Bar. With Built, health, healthily is actually tasty. Seriously, they're so delicious, you won't think they're good for you. They're perfect for your New Year's resolution, even though it's a little late in the game. It's never too late to re- revamp the New Year's resolution. And what makes Built Bar so good, um, they're covered in 100% real chocolate. That's right, not real chocolate, or they're real chocolate. Not that fake stuff where it's chocolate adjacent. It's that real stuff. And they come in unbelievable flavors like churro, peanut butter, and brownie, and coconut almond. I'm not sure how Built Bar does it, but these bars taste like a candy bar while maintaining amazing macros. And what's even better is they are healthy, only 130 calories for those counting calories, and 4 grams of sugar because we know we got to keep that sugar down, and 17 grams of protein. Um, that's, that's pretty good. That'll help you get to your daily goal. And now you don't have to wait around to get a box. For years, we've been talking about ordering at Built Bar's for at builtbars.com now you can get them at your local walmart or sam's club that's right head to your walmart today walk to the pharmacy section and grab yourself a box of built bars you could pick up a four bar box of chocolate or of cookies and cream double chocolate or coconut puffs if you're close to sam's club run in and grab 13 bar box with our hit flavors brownie batter and churro you could thank me later let's get those gains it's never too late to to revamp the the new year's resolution we're all trying to better ourselves built bar will help you do that you know who else is trying to better themselves, John? Colorado, the Pac-12, the Big 12. Conference expansion is back. It's alive. Um, we've been writing about it nonstop. There, there's just craziness. The Pac-12, let me give you some, some background. The Pac-12 waited too long to get a Pac-12 media rights deal going. The Big 12 then, in fact, jumped them in line, even though their deal wasn't expiring for another couple of years. Big 12 not only got a deal, they expanded with four teams, so they'll be at 12 teams following the loss of Texas and Oklahoma. Meanwhile, the Pac-12 is kind of just sitting there with their hands, twiddling their thumbs, and there's been rumors that the Big 12 wants the four corner schools, which is Arizona, Arizona State, Utah, and Colorado. John, do you foresee a move to the Big 12 for Colorado, or do you think the Pac-12 kind of figures it out? Well, if Colorado is going to have the B enemy buildup that we're talking about there, then I think the timing works out well for for the the Big 12 because look the Pac 12 is in trouble you know I think it's pretty clear to see at this point everyone is is leaning towards that super conference conversation and yeah the the only conference that we feel like today for sure won't build their own is the Pac 12 so naturally every administration in that conference every head coach of every sport has their head on a swivel just a little bit and again from an administrative standpoint, do you bring in a Deion Sanders and build all this buzz to then fall behind as these super conferences theoretically take shape? Of course not, right? This has to be the the draw the line in the sand, plant the flag moment to say, hey, you know, we, we've got to continue to push a- along with some of these trends. So, yeah, I think it would certainly fit. Obviously, Colorado has, has been there before, literally. Uh, so I, I think that's a natural um, push for nostalgia. Folks want to see that just in general. And you mentioned some of the schools that that could be of interest for the conference. Look, everybody recruits Arizona anyway, whether you're in the Pac-12 or the Big 12 footprint. Uh, Utah itself has built itself into a, as stable a program as there is in this country. And then Colorado, both geographically and now from a buzz standpoint, has always made sense for that conference. So, yeah, I think with, with the trends uh, and, and with everything kind of resettling a little bit, You've got to keep your options open and push for something because it's not going to work in the Big Ten. They're, they're too big at this point. Um, and you don't fit in any way, shape, or form in, in the SEC or ACC. So naturally, it's almost by default that the Big 12 has got to be where you you keep your eyes on uh, and you try to stay in communication with as much as humanly possible. So we, we've seen these things happen before. Teams go in and out of certain conferences. Uh, so it wouldn't be a huge surprise to see Colorado do something similar in the coming years. Uh, But because of all of that, all the pressure shifts right back to the Pac-12. What does it look like? Um, If you go for volume and you bring in a bunch of Mountain West uh, type programs, is that going to move the needle? Will people view you 
as a super conference. Unfortunately, in college and just like in recruiting, perception is very important. Uh, so I, I think everybody's aware of those facts. Uh, and I think it, it provides the advantage for schools that are open to such movement. And in this case, for Colorado, schools that have already lived and breathed in that uh, conference footprint. Yeah, I think the cool thing for Colorado and Colorado fans is, you know, you're going to be in a conference, you know, you have options. There are some programs out there, uh, not to name names, Washington State, Oregon State, who are kind of on the outside looking in, hoping that the Pac-12 figures it out, because if not, they're not the big brands or the the markets that people want. Um, Colorado is luckily the only power five program in the state of Colorado. Um, Obviously, Colorado State is in the Mountain West, but um, totally different things. I think the Obviously, the Big 12 fit, it's a fit because they've already they've already been there, done that. Um, I think Deion Sanders being at Colorado, going back to our first topic, really, um, that just makes the program more enticing. Couldn't have happened at a better time because I think if Colorado without Deion Sanders is on the market, maybe people don't want to grab them as quickly. Um, I still think they'd get a they'd still be in a conference. But now it's like we have to get Deion Sanders in Colorado. And so Boulder being in the Big 12, I mean, Colorado being in the Big 12, excuse me. Um, It just makes sense. They've already been there. Um, I think adding the three other schools, you kind of have your built-in rivals. You have Utah, BYU, um, two Arizonas, Colorado has experience playing them all. And then you kind of rekindle some old rivals. And so it wouldn't shock me if the, if Colorado ends up in the big 12, Um, but the PAC 12 still has a chance. Um, Surprisingly, they are backs are up against the walls, but they do have a chance to go make some moves. It's just, will they make the necessary moves? We'll find that out. Um, I feel like the timeline is within the next couple of months, we got to figure something out. Um, I think they've kind of been for lack of a better ter- term, just pussyfooting around the whole time, just like not doing what they need to do. And it's like, make a move. Everybody's right. waiting. Everything is accelerated. Everything yeah. is moving. Right. Yeah, like, if anything, people are making agreements and then jumping over sooner. Right. We're going to see it with USC and UCLA. We already saw Texas, Oklahoma push their SEC timeline up a year. Everyone's moving faster, not slower. So, yeah, you hit it right on the head there. Yeah, I think the Pac-12 needs to do something. But if you're a Colorado fan, just know if it's not the Pac-12, you'll be in the Big 12 or something will work out for you. Now, whether it's in the Pac-12, the Big 12, a combined of the two, I don't know. We'll find that out as we continue to learn more. Um, What we do know, though, is that this is the Locked on Bus podcast. I'm Kevin Borba from Athlon Sports. That's John Garcia. He's the recruiting insider. We will be here every day for you. And before we go, we again need you to go check out, and this should be your second listen of the day because obviously Locked on Bus needs to be your first on your commute, your run, your jog, whatever it may be. Thank you for making it your first listen of the day, by the way. But for your second, check out our brand new podcast, Locked on College Basketball. Experts Isaac Shad and Andy Patton bring you everything you need to know on and off the court, plus – Hear from big name expert coaches and players throughout the basketball landscape. Locked on College Basketball, available on YouTube, wherever you get your podcast. Thank you guys for listening to our inaugural episode of Locked on Buffs. Uh, make sure to like, subscribe, share it with all your friends, and we will catch you guys tomorrow. Peace.